Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's live stream of Ancient Games. Uh, we're going to get started in just a second. Just putting a post up on Facebook. So, this week we are running something called the Not So Spooky Fall Sale, which uh, has lots of our older stuff on sale for up to 75% off. But a lot of people have come to know us, you know, in the Innovation Red 7 One Deck Dungeon era. You haven't heard of any of our really old games from years like 2007. Um, yes, we were around back then making games, and some of them are actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give some quick overviews and explanations of some of our older stuff. Um, because as far as I know, there aren't really any videos of it out on the internet because there wasn't an internet in 2007. We were still like using cans and strings to talk instead of phones and horses. It was a very dark time for gaming. Um, I believe it's working. Good. Hooray, it's working. All right. So our very first game, very, very long time ago, was called Gold Thief. It's a very original title. Copyright 2005. 2005. That's before most of you were born, right? No. Um, so Gold Thief is the simple little card game idea that I used uh, as our first game. And we've still got a few copies of it left over because we printed a whole lot. Uh, and we are selling these for $2 during the fall sale. So if you want a copy of this game, it is super cheap. So Gold Thief is a game about stealing shinies. It in fact comes with 25 shinies. Uh, in this game, each player in the game starts off with five shinies. You can call them gold if you want. And you will be given a secret goal of how many shinies you want to have. This one says that you want to have either four or ten. You want to have zero or six. All of them have one low number and one high number. Uh, and all of them range from zero to ten. So everyone gets dealt a secret goal at the start of the game, uh, and you peek at it and say, hmm, okay, I need that many. You might notice that none of the cards have the number five on them because that's what you start with, and that would be too easy. Uh, your object, your objective, is to have that many gold in your possession at the start of your turn. So you spend your turn wheeling and dealing and stealing stuff, and then you have to get back to your own turn with the same amount to be able to score a goal. And you're, you win by scoring three of them. And I have miscalculated the size of the screen. Okay, there we go. Um, so the way that you steal the gold uh, is using all these action cards. And there are five different cards in the deck uh, in varying quantities. Uh, there are, the, the basic card is of course the thief. Um, there's the witch, the guard, the fairy, and the ninja. Uh, each of them has a thing you can do on your turn. Uh, and also a thing you can do in response to something else that happens. Uh, so the Thief is the simplest card. On your turn, you can play it to steal two gold. So if I played a, a Thief, I could say, I'm just stealing these two gold. Uh, you can use a Witch to steal cards from somebody's hand. They have to randomly give you one. Uh, and you can use the Guard to give away a gold. Um, you know, sometimes you're one over what your target is, so you might want to do that. Uh, the Fairy lets you trade in a goal if you don't like it, or if you're not in any place near it. Uh, and the ninja lets you draw three action cards. There are only two, th two ninjas in the deck because they are the best card, clearly. Um, there is also an expansion in Wacky Cat Curl called the Pirate Card. Ooh. So you can buy that too, you get two of them. Um, each, of the action, each of the cards also has a response action. Uh, so the thief says you can respond to an opponent's thief by raiding one gold. So if it's my turn, and I try and steal two gold from this person. And they're like, hmm, I only want you to steal one of those gold because my goal has a four on it. They can respond by playing a thief and take one of them back. Um, the response from the guard is to outright block a thief, uh, which, you know, if you want to keep your gold, you can do that. Uh, and the response of a witch is to add an extra thief. So. If I play a thief to try and steal two gold from this guy, and I have a witch in my hand, I can say, actually, I'm stealing four gold. Um, interestingly, he can also play 
the witch to make me steal four gold uh, because he might have a goal of one. Um, it is very much a bluffing game because nobody knows what your goal is. And you might say, you know, my goal here is four or nine, so I might be going explicitly for nine. But my goal might also be something like zero or seven. And I steal gold to get up to nine in my turn, hoping that somebody will steal two from me during the rest of the round, that when my turn starts, I have the right number to score the goal. Um, that's really it. It's, it's a very simple, fun, ten-minute game. Um, if you wind up with a giant pile of gold, if you ever start your turn with more than 10 gold, uh, you get to score a goal for free. And that's to stop the game from sort of stagnating. Um, all right. So really, that is Gold Thief. That is all there is to it. It is a simple game. Um, I like it. I made it. <laughs> and it comes with lots of shinies that are interesting and weird. And make lots of noise when I drag them across the table, apparently. Alright, so Gold Thief was our very first game. Um, we launched it, like I said, back in 2005. Uh, we sold some at Otacon because at the very beginning of our uh, company we started off by going to anime cons and Artist Alley and places. Um, and eventually got them out into stores and, and stuff. Uh, in the meantime, we, made, we didn't play Test This at all, which uh, is one of our biggest titles still to date. Uh, but also, our second game was a very silly and terrible idea called Whack a Cat Girl. Whack a Cat Girl is a game where you throw objects at a cat girl. Um, as I said, we started out very much in the anime con area. So, you know, throw a plushie at a cat girl, it's funny. Probably not a game we would make today, but. It's here. It's for sale for $3 in our sale, because uh, we have about 100 copies left um, of all the copies ever printed. Um, so Whack a Cat Girl, also fairly simple game in terms of rules. Uh, there is a deck of cards, and these are all objects, for example, plushies. Look at these beautiful Inuyasha plushies, or this ball of yarn. And the camera's kind of focusing. Or, of course, a glomp me sign. Um, so every object on the deck has a certain number of hearts, which is how much the cat girl likes the thing, and a certain number of points, which is how valuable it is to throw that object at the cat girl. Your objective is to score the most points. So throwing a bucket of water is more funny than throwing just a plain old chinny. Uh, so the way the game plays is there's a deck of cards which is common to all the players, and you deal out two rows of three as an item shop. Uh, red cards in the shop are items, and blue cards are actions. Uh, red cards are things that you'll collect in front of you, uh, blue cards are things that you'll use once. So on your turn in Catcrawl, you get to take an item from the item shop. Um, the bottom row is the discount rack, and the top row is the premium section. Whenever something's taken from the bottom row, new cards fill in. Uh, and you're only allowed to take something from the top row if you have nothing in front of you. Um, so let's say I take this ball of yarn. That's very exciting. Uh, on your turn, you get to do two things. You get to do one thing. Sorry. Uh, you can either take a card from the middle, or you can throw something at the cat girl. Uh, so simple first turn is to take a card. Let's say some people take some cards, and we get around to here. It's my turn, I'm going to have some more stuff in front of me. So once you have some cards, you can start doing stuff. Uh, in order to throw an object at the cat girl, you have to already have things to lure her over. For example, this ball of yarn. Uh, this ball of yarn has two hearts on it, which is enough to lure over Neko-chan, the cat girl, to throw a plushie at her and score two points. Um, to lure her over, you have to spend at least two hearts worth of items. If you spend two hearts, you get to score one other card by throwing it. If you spend at least six hearts, you get to throw two other cards. So, you know, if I had already gotten this camera and uh, more plushies, I could have a giant turn. I'm cheating. So let's say I spend uh, six, I throw six cards into the discard pile, six hearts rather. I can score two of these other cards. Um, and they're worth 
you know, four points for me at the end of the game. Um, you go through the entire deck, continuing to do this, and whoever has the most points at the end wins. Uh, what makes all the cards interesting is they all have a special power. Many of them have a power that activates when they're taken. Uh, for example, when you take the camera, you can blind another player with the flash and they lose a turn. Uh, when you take the plushies, um, you can trade it for anything that somebody else has, because who's going to turn down a plushie trade? Uh, the giant mallet lets you smush a card any place in play. Uh, and any, any of the blue cards, as soon as you take them, have some sort of special effect. Um, so, gameplay-wise, that's the whole explanation. The beauty of a lot of our earlier games is they really are, you know, take a minute to explain, and then you can just start playing. Um, there's, not, uh, <laughs> there's not the rules depth that you see in an innovation or one-deck dungeon, but that's fine. These were light and silly games, and that's fun. Um, so, Whack Cat Girl has all of this beautiful art on it that we drew... Uh, my friend Valerie, or Roller Gal, uh, who doesn't really do a lot of art anymore, but she has a nice, fun style, drew all of these pictures. Uh, and this is my expert graphic design of putting a solid color on top of white background. Um, thankfully, nowadays, we have Alana, and, and she's better at this. <laughs> so that is Wacky Cat Girl. Uh, we also have the Crazy Characters expansion up on the website. It is a set of uh, index cards that just give you a static special power for the entire game. All right. Do, do, do. Uh, Cat Girl has a few cards that are PG-13, but nothing worse than that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> nothing you would not see in an anime con nowadays, certainly. Um, all right, so those are a couple of our earlier games. The next thing I'm going to show you is a game called Bedlam. It's like crazy Bedlam, but it's had a bee on it, so it's a lamb. It's a sheep joke. Oh my goodness. Um, it's funny. Uh, so Bedlam was a silly idea I had a number of years ago uh, for a three-pronged prisoner's dilemma. Uh, this one is from 2011. And it never really made it to market, because we assembled a bunch of them ourselves, and this was during the entire Game Salute fiasco, where we thought that they were going to competently distribute all of our games and ideas. As it turned out, that didn't happen. So this game kind of disappeared and died, uh, for no particular reason. Um, it didn't wind up having a, a full professional print run. But we do have a bunch of copies of the hand-assembled ones that we, uh, we made. Um, from from way back then. We actually had a shipping party where a bunch of people came to our house and we all just put together sets of this because it's really just cards and some tokens. Um, so in Bedlam, you are sheep traders. And you are trying to claim these blue tokens which are called sheepium ore. It's, you know, what you trade sheep for. So each player has an identical deck of nine sheep cards, except one of them is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Oh no. Um, and one of them is a sheep decoy, which is just an adorable drawn sheep on a billboard. Uh, so they're, they vary in number zero, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the wolf. Uh, and what you're going to do in different turns of, uh, of Bedlam is you're going to arrange trades. So you're going to have your hand of nine cards, and you get to put three of them out, one traded to each of your three uh, opponents. Uh, and they're going to do the same. And you're allowed to say things while you're doing this. So you can be like, ah, oh, I'm giving you a really good sheep here. This is a six. It's going to be fine. Um, because a lot of things depend on what you trade with other people. I'm just throwing out random cards here as an example. Um, We'll just pretend this is good play. Because really, uh, as soon as you see how one round resolves, the game makes sense. So each of the four players is going to trade one sheep with each of their neighbors and put one sheep into the middle, which is the grazing fields. Um, and on your helpful reference card, it tells you exactly how to resolve the entire turn. Uh, so the first thing that happens after everyone's put down their cards and talked about them, being like, ah, I'm putting a wolf in the middle, you suckers. Everyone reveals their sheep in the middle. 
what's going to happen is the highest sheep is going to get a point. Uh, in this case, it's the eight over here. Um, this player cheated, but we'll ignore that. Uh, and that that's all. So if there was a wolf out there, he would have stolen all the sheep. Um, so yes, I score my sheep. Once you play the sheep, it goes to your score pile. Uh, and then the more interesting part is we reveal all of our trades. So trades always involve each player swapping one of their sheep to the other to their opponent. Um, at the end of the entire round, when you've played all nine of your cards, you're going to total up the value of all of your sheep in the middle. Uh, sorry, all of the sheep you've scored for the round. So I'm giving this minus two to my opponent, and he's giving me back a four. Um, except that all the sheep have a special ability. And the four says the mysterious sheep rejects all trades. So instead of giving away my minus two, I wind up keeping it because the trade was rejected. Uh, so all these special powers trigger. You might notice sometimes they're unfair, tra unfair trades. So I'm trying to trade this three for a seven. Um, if I make a trade that's bad, um, that is, it's three or more worse than the card I'm giving them. I have to give them a point, which is a sheepium ore, uh, as part of the trade. This is important because the sheepium ore are your points for the game, and that's what you're trying to claim. Uh, at the start of the game, each player gets three, uh, and you get them by doing trades over the course of, of playing. Um, so over here, we've got a wolf. Uh, wolf just steals the sheep, so sneaky. So we do this three times. Everyone plays out their sheep. Some trades happen. Sometimes you get stolen. Sometimes trades are rejected. Um, each of the nine sheep has its own special power. And like I said, everyone has the same set of nine, so you know what all the special powers in the game are. Uh, at the end of the whole round, you total up the value of all the sheep that you've traded for during the round. Um, and then you get to take one ore from each player that's lower than you, score-wise. So whoever has the highest is going to get one from each, so three. Whoever's in second place is going to wind up netting one sheep more, and whoever's in last place is going to wind up probably losing three. So there's tie, you just don't uh, trade any with that player. Um, and we play three full rounds of that, three days essentially of trading, uh, and say, see who has the most sheep at the end of the game. Uh, so what the gameplay boils down to, like I said, is a three-pronged prisoner's dilemma. Um, if I'm threatening to play a wolf, the player to my right might want to play, put down a low sheep. But if I know they're going to put down a low sheep, I might put down a high one so that it's an unfair trade and they have to give me money in return. Um, so there's a lot of second guessing and bluffing and uh, fun use of little player powers. Um, it is a game that takes probably 15 minutes to play tops and only a couple minutes to explain. Really the best way to explain it is to just play around randomly and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> a thing we later used for Club Flag Innovation. Uh, so all of these adorable sheep were drawn by Sarah who was actually doing the art for 1001 Odysseys and who drew the pretty landscapes for Fealty. Ooh, forests. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. So that is Bedlam. Bedlam is uh, also available for $2 on the uh, special sale this week. So if you want a silly quick game that is definitely worth $2, Bedlam is for you. Next up, I'm going to show one of our sillier ideas um, but still one of my favorites is Carl Chudik's extremely complicated, serious, important, and uh, strategic game, Flower Fall. So uh, a few years ago, <laughs> Carl, who designed Innovation in Glory to Rome and Matainai, was like, I have a great idea for a ridiculous game. And I'm like, okay, Carl, I will listen to your ridiculous idea for a great game. Um, what it involves is all these cards with flowers on them. 
so to play Flowerfall, you set up a board of some index card, index card sized cards. Um, and each player gets a stack of flower cards uh, with a color on them. So there's orange here and purple and black. And what you do on your turn is you shuffle up your cards and you draw one of them and then you drop it onto the table. And over the course of the game, all these flowers get dropped onto the table. And I'm just going to throw some more out here for effect. After everyone has played all of their cards, and sometimes they flip over uh, and there's more neutral flowers in the back, you look at <laughs> this mess of amazing flower disaster on the table. Um, there are little white walls, and of course the table itself is a wall. Uh, so you look at each section uh, of independent flowers, and I'm just going to move it a little bit so that it's less broken. So this is one section of one, one uh, field. Um, and purple has three flowers, black has one, and orange has one. So whichever player has the most flowers in a field, and a flower is visible if you can see its dot, um, wins that field. And it's worth one point for each of the green neutral flowers in there. So purple would get three points off of this field. And then there's this giant mess, uh, and any place you can trace the green background means this is one giant field with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine flowers. Uh, and black has it. So in this case, black would get nine points, purple would get three points. Um, obviously when you're playing with all of the cards, you get bigger fields and more of them. Uh, but that's really the whole game. The whole game is just dropping your flowers onto the table. It's, it's, it's fun, it's simple. It is a great game for kids. And there's the added strategy of you can drop it face up or face down. So face down, every card has five neutral flowers on it to add more points. So, you know, if I just drop my card over here in the corner, I can try and aim a card over there to add points to it. And if I do that successfully, maybe I sneak out these ten points that nobody was paying attention to because they're all putting stuff in the middle. Um, flower fall plays from two to seven players, because there's seven different colors of deck in here. Uh, it is fantastic for kids, and it's really quick and silly. Uh, you can also play variants where you try and throw cards in from the side of the table. Uh, you can play where you have to drop them sideways and stuff happens. There's all sorts of things. You can play with a fan if you want uh, to make it really hard. Um, yes, Flowerfall is awesome. Uh, Flowerfall is on sale for, I think, 675 or something it's on sale for cheap flower fall is awesome play flower fall it will make you happier <laughs> flower fall is a more fun uh activity than reading stuff about the election this year all right so those are all of our light old games um the one last game i want to take a peek at real quick right now is fealty so Fealty was one of our first Kickstarters. Uh, might have been our first Kickstarter. And Fealty is a game uh, of abstract strategy. Where you play pieces onto uh, a fairly mm, ordered board, trying to control as many spaces of it as you can. Um, so each space on the board has some number of textural features on it. There's forest, there's field, there's mountains, there's cities and roads. Uh, and your pieces will go down and lay claim to a certain amount of area of that, uh, that board. Um, the trick being, while they sort of stake out their claim when you play it, they don't actually take the, the, the spaces until the end of the entire game. So everyone gets to play all of their pieces out before anyone scores any points. Uh, so you'll get this big, messy board with lots of pieces on it, and then at the end, the pieces will score. Every piece has a number on it, uh, from 10 up to 90, and the 10s will score first. Um, this is balanced by the fact that the 10s, the 20s, the 30s capture the smallest amount of areas, and the 70s, 80s, and 90s capture big swaths of area. Uh, every piece has an associated card. Uh, so you can see that the, the number 10 agent captures any city within two. It goes first, uh, but there aren't very many cities on the boards. The agent 
uh, doesn't capture everything. The 90, which goes last, captures every space within 4. But it goes last, so most of those spaces have already been captured. Uh, at the end of the game, let's say that for some reason these players both only played one piece. Uh, so at the end of the game, you would score. So let's say the scholar here captures two in a straight line from where it is. So uh, we would put down influence tokens to show that the scholar has taken these spaces, which is pretty good. That's eight points. The court noble, as we said, captures everything within four. Um, however, it can't go through pieces of the other colors. So even though this is within four, you have to actually be able to take a walk to get there. So you only get to go one, two, three, four. Uh, so the court noble sort of spills out every place that's within four spaces that doesn't go through anybody else's color or through any mountains. Um, <laughs> I had picked the court noble, which is a huge piece. So the court noble would take all of this area. Uh, cities are worth two points each instead of one. So they would all get a second token. Um, so yeah, even though these spaces are near the court noble, the scholar went first and sort of blocked them off. Um, so as you can see, when you're playing several pieces on the board, uh, in a normal game you play either six or nine, depending on how many boards you play with, uh, there will be all sorts of obstacles. So, you know, if there was a court noble here and a knight here, the court noble would really get blocked off and not get very many points. Uh, so the way the game plays, uh, let me just make a mess of the table. Demo table mess. Uh, you have your deck of these nine cards that are associated with all the pieces that you have. Um, and Fealty also comes with two different sets of pieces for each color. So there's a variety. There's, you know, the 40 on the front and the 45 on the back. So there's actually two different sets of pieces you can play with. Uh, to start the game, you randomly draw three of the cards. Um, so you'll have this hand. And each turn, both players simultaneously select a card. Whoever played the lower numbered uh, piece that turn gets to go first. So in addition to having initiative on the board, you have initiative in placement. So let's say I play the 20, I go first, it goes here. This does two things. One, I get to place it here. Two, it blocks off this board for the rest of the turn. Two player game means the other player has to go over here. Uh, in, a multi in a larger game, there'll be more boards, and so it'll just sort of narrow down everyone's selections. Um, going first is good. Um, so let's say they played a scholar over here. On the next turn, uh, we'll again, we'll draw a card, so we'll be back up to three, and then we'll again choose one of our cards, simultaneously reveal, and this goes on until both players have played six, uh, six tiles. Or, if you're playing the long game, uh, you play until you've both played eight tiles. After all that, um, the tiles each score their area, from 10 up to 90, and you see who has captured the most uh, tiles on the board, who has the most influence. Um, as I mentioned, the cities are worth two, uh, and mountains are impassable. Uh, there's one other restriction for placing. When you're putting down a tile, uh, sorry, when you're putting down a piece, you can't go in the same row or the same column as something you've already placed. So as the game goes on, your options get more and more limited. Um, so, uh, also, all of the cards, when they're played, have a special power. Uh, the Court Noble, the 90, lets you claim a space immediately. Uh, the Agent lets you move one of the pieces you've already placed. The Knight lets you put a conflict marker, which is essentially a wall someplace near it. Uh, the Guard Post doesn't move, that's a great power. Um, and so you have to factor in these powers also. Uh, there's a couple of moves that mean that, you know, even though somebody's placed down a, a, a quick piece to block you, you might be able to move sometime during the game and sort of cut them off instead. So, uh, Fealty, great little abstract strategy game. Uh, we've got it on sale, I think, for $9 um, from its original retail price of 30 Fealty is, of course, another victim of the game's loot fiasco. It was the game we were going to use to launch with them. That didn't go so well, and it sort of had a hard time getting into retail sense. Um, but it is a fantastic game. 
Um, Eric that designed this, like I said, also is making Spirit Island for Greater Than Games, uh, which kickstarted earlier this year or last year, and they're almost ready to produce it. Uh, so that is another game you should check out in the future. Um, all right, so that is all of the old games. Let me show you something cool that is new. <laughs> and that is One Deck Dungeon. Uh, I'm not going to play through a game, but I wanted to show that we got one of the samples back from the factory. Um, this is not on the actual card stock, this is on the proofing stock, which is uh, <laughs> the same sort of stuff that come out of my printer. Uh, but what you can see is the colors on them, uh, which are very, very nice. Uh, so you can see the newer blue uh, for the magic and the sharper contrast between the yellow and the, the pink. Um, and of course our fabulous set of five heroes. Uh, so all the colors came out very, very bright and vibrant on these. I don't know if it's coming through super well on a Twitch, but... Uh, and I cut these myself, so they're sort of clipped. Oops. Um, it's looking really good. They're getting ready to put them onto the presses, I think, this week, so that we'll be able to ship them in about two weeks. And I am excited about that, because that means we get to give One Deck Dungeon out to all people, and that is awesome. Um, we are also working on the expansion for One Deck Dungeon, and we've started drawing art for it. Uh, we will be showing that off in the coming weeks as we get uh, the game out. I figure we should get the first game out before we start showing the expansion art, uh, just by a little bit. Alright, so thank you all for listening in. I'm going to save this to YouTube so people can watch uh, <laughs> little blurbs about Gold Thief, Cat Girl, Flowerfall, Bedlam, uh, and of course Fealty, uh, because they are all great little games, uh, even though they are old. And you can get them for really cheap this week, so might as well, and also help us clean out the office, because we've got shelves of old stuff that we want to get rid of. Uh, Alright, so thank you everybody, and bye for now.